Yes, it says that we're live now. Hi, everybody. Just one little second. I'll be right with you. I'm trying to find the email that you sent me. Where it had your abbreviated three sentences. I have a lot of trouble finding anything after I open it. And I know I should be able to find this so much easier than this. So Linda, do you do comedy yourself? Yes, hold up. I'm in the middle of trying to start the interview and do your interview, and I cannot find your introduction. So tell me your introduction, and then I'll say it. I know this is hokey, but that's the best we can do right now. So tell me your introduction, Alex, please. My name is Alex, and many people think that I have a hokey market, but I don't. Your audio is going in and out. Oh, well, that's me. Do you have two computers on? No, I just have one computer on. How's this okay. sound? It should be okay. Now right? it's fine. So you gave me like three or four sentences. Can you say those to me so I can write them down and say them? Sure. Thank you, Alex. I can't find it. All right, well, I lived in brooklyn mm -hmm. i started i worked i got married mm -hmm. i have a son i took up comedy i took balloon making and i took up acting and singing and that's basically it and now i'm a member of a comedy class i want to learn how to do comedy perfect thank you so much i'm so sorry everybody this is totally unprofessional but this is life in the real world these days we're of a certain age trying to do things with equipment that's much younger than us. So just bear with us. Every time, oh, I, get I, an, every time I get an email, I go to open it up again and it seems to be gone. So you guys at home watching, welcome to Comic Spot. This is interview number 848. Alex Glatt is here today from New York City. I would like to do the introduction for him in just a second. First, let me give a nod to my one and only sponsor. I am a proud member of the veteran. I'm a veteran. I'm a proud military veteran. I was in the army, 73 to 76 in Germany. And I do comedy for the military and veterans. That's my passion inside of comedy. And so therefore, my only sponsor is my exclusive sponsor is the veterans of comedy everybody so if you ever need to have a comedian serve up jokes think about having somebody who used to serve our country serve up jokes they can do it and you can find people like myself and even better at the veterans of comedy.com and that's the intro to the show kick back enjoy this interaction between me and my guests today and today let me just give you a little backdrop everybody at home i have friends in new york and i got invited to be in this thing called zoom that was happening at this place called greenwich house that's evidently in, in the greenwich area of new york and i get into this thing that's evidently a class and they're helping us learn comedy. And in there, Alex is in there, as well as quite a few other people who are living in the senior housing. And we're all having a riot of a great time. We have a great facilitator named Joe Firestone. She's been, she's been on, she's been a writer for late night. She's done Comedy Central interviews. She has done so much. She's a great writer. She's a professional comedy writer, uh, big time. And she's in this, coming to this uh, senior housing on a weekly basis, helping seniors 
learn comedy, laugh, and have fun at this stage of their life. But when the pandemic hit, it became a Zoom thing. So me out in Vegas, I become part of this thing and got to meet Alex and all these wonderful people. And then Joe pitched it to the networks and now it's streaming on Pete Peacock Channel, on Peacock Channel called Good Timing with Joe Firestone and a whole lot of the seniors that are in the class on a weekly basis are in that show. Alex and I, for different reasons, aren't in the show, but we're in the weekly class. How is that for the backdrop, Alex? Pretty good. I have to say that. Uh, Joe actually led the class. The Greenwich House, by the way, is in Greenwich Village, New York City. Uh, most of the people do live in Greenwich Village. On the west side, which is the classier side of the village, and usually very expensive to live there. Uh, but the Greenwich House has been putting out senior services for over 100 years now. Yes. And so today, Alex, my yes, guest today, is here. Right. No. And he, give, he gave me the tips to his personal introduction. So now I'm going to read them back to him because that's how hokey this is today. Alex is originally from the Brooklyn part of New York City. He worked. He got married. He had a son. He's done comedy. And he's done balloon carving, I think is what they professionally call it. Yeah. What's that? Sculpting. Balloon sculpting, twisting balloons. Balloon, balloon sculpting. Twisting. He's yeah. done acting and singing. And now he's in the comedy class that Joe Firestone teaches. So there's your introduction. Welcome to this little stage of mine. This is comic spot. Joe Firestone has been here and some of the other people in the class. But I keep getting sick off and on. So finally got you on and you're going to be going to surgery and not too long from now right all those people uh, all those bosses that wanted to wring my neck it's too late i did it for them <laughs> and now i'm going to have my neck done uh surgically so are they gonna is that like cardioid artery stuff no it's gonna be uh actual cutting bones out putting rods and screws in so we'll see how that goes. Wow. Yeah. That's something else. We will pray for that. Yeah. Yeah. So I started off, uh, you know. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you before you go into your history, if you'd uh, allow me to. Um, you've made it through the pandemic in a hotbed. America's hotbed of the pandemic pretty much right. has been New York City. Yep. So would you speak to what that has been like for you personally and to your inner circle of people you know and love? Well, basically, I and my son had COVID. We got it in March of 2020. And <clears throat> you got it in March of what? 2020. Okay. Excuse me. Sure. <clears throat> Dog is here. Anyway, we had COVID in 2020 and we recovered after about seven to 10 days. A total of 15 days was wasted with that. Uh, after that, you know, I have, we both have loss from it. There's a loss of breathing on my part. So, but be that as it may, New York is pretty tight about that everybody is supposed to wear a mask when you go out definitely when you go to a restaurant if you're in a restaurant you have no proof of vaccination if you didn't get vaccinated i've seen people being evicted uh some anti-vaxxers have actually been very forceful in their attitudes of i'll call it stupidity but due to your readers you know you may have a large of readers that don't want to get vaccinated who knows but for some reason there seems to be a greater portion of the people that don't want to get vaccinated um so we're all vaccinated we have all three shots and 
we're all set with that. It is kind of uh, weird that there are very few places that you can go in New York City because everything is really shut down. You can't go dancing, you can't go out to social meetings, you can't have large gatherings, everybody has to wear a mask. It's very difficult uh, with that. Uh, people do not normally walk on the street without a mask unless they're like a little children or pretty much ignorant. Um, so it makes for a very, very dull social life. Yes. Uh, I'm in my, uh, Go ahead. You go ahead. What were you finishing? Oh, I mean, I personally am impacted by my body at this point. Uh, for the first time in three years, I actually went into New York City to go to the soiree that they were having for the Peacock Channel. And uh, when I say it's the first time I've gone into the city in three years by train myself, that's a long time not to go into New York, Manhattan. Yeah. Not that I go into Manhattan myself. People have to understand that New York City is not only Manhattan. Manhattan is just one facet of all of New York City. And Manhattan is uh, what everybody thinks of when they think of New York City. Yes, there's five boroughs. True. Yeah, well, there are five boroughs. I live in the borough of Queens right now. The borough of Brooklyn. I lived in Manhattan for a while, and it is very difficult, believe it or not, to travel in Manhattan itself, because if you live in Manhattan and have to go to Midtown, let's say you live on a 4th Street or 10th Street, you have to go to 32nd Street, it's still going to take you a half hour, 45 minutes to get there, no matter what you do. If you live in Queens, it'll take you the same amount of time to go across town to get yes. there so but, at the um any other of your friends or relatives affected by covid when you and your son were stricken with it well my wife was not uh it seems that she was just immune to it what can i tell you there are people who have certain blood types who are immune to it yes and, uh, i got mine basically the first time i got it was airborne because I didn't touch anyone. I didn't, I had gone shopping. I had come home. Three days later, I got it. Gee. It was just very weird. I didn't touch anybody. I just picked up groceries, paid my groceries. So you don't know if it's contact, you don't know if it's air. Since it's an airborne disease, you don't yeah. have a choice. You know, so let me, ask, let me ask you this question, Alex. Other than the class on Zoom and the good timing coming out of the pandemic, which was great, what are some other good things that you've witnessed in New York City that have been a byproduct, a good byproduct of the pandemic? I've seen restaurants reopen, I've seen businesses reopen. I've seen people daring to go out and enjoying myself at a restaurant. I've been to the movies myself with my son, which has been very nice. Uh, even though we had to wear our masks in our movie theater, it was very good that we were able to go out. Um, so. <clears throat> I know the world is sitting around waiting and watching for what's going on in Times Square with Broadway. Is it open? Is it closed? Some of it's closed. What's going on? Well, from what I understand, since Broadway casts usually consist of a couple of people, the odds of one person not having COVID are very, very slim. So it's very difficult to keep a Broadway show open at any one time due to the pandemic limitations. So if they have one person who is sick, they'll shut them down, which is very uh, difficult for people, especially since you're now paying two to $300 per ticket. So there are no cheap Broadway tickets anymore. There, are no, uh, there is a student discount if you're a student at a college, but 
There is no such thing as a Broadway show. Uh, movie ticket, movie theater now is $15 per person when you walk in. That includes, let's say, a drink if you want. And you're a citizen, maybe you get away with 10 or $12, but that's about it. Wow. Well, let's go back in time. Mm. Let's take a time machine and travel back to little Alex Glatt. Oh, how about we give each other 50 years and go back? That'll be good. I was wondering where you were born and raised. You were born and raised in Brooklyn. What part of Brooklyn? It's a district called Borough Park. I love Borough Park. There's a lot of us who are Jewish that live there. Yes. Or there was more than now. Yes, there are still. There are. Um, Brooklyn is predominantly, uh, has a very, very high Jewish population. It has a very high Italian population. And it still does. It, but now you and I are a minority in New York City because most of New York City is multicultural now. Yes. Yeah. This isn't really the year of popularity for being Jewish. Not, you know, like out here on the West Coast, not in New York City, but out here in the West Coast, in the comedy clubs, a lot of times, the comedians say horrible things about the Jewish people in their comedy. Really? Yeah, it's a rude, they'd never try that in New York, but I know Helene Witt told me somebody did use the punchline um, effing person of our ethnicity as a punchline. I hate that punchline. Oh, I would hate it with any group, you know? You don't need to say effing anything. No. This, it's not funny. No, it isn't funny. <laughs> it isn't funny. But Peter, there are some people that get off on music. Yes. So you little know. Alex Glad, he's in Borough Park. Yes. How many brothers and sisters did you have? <laughs> okay. I have one sister and one brother. My sister, Rabbi. And my brother was a psychiatrist. He's now a teacher. Um, we were all raised by our parents in Brooklyn. My father was an accountant. Uh, my mother was a homemaker and a real estate agent, then became a real estate agent because she was tired of staying at home and started selling houses. Uh, of course, my parents died at that point. So, you know, I did the uh, whole Brooklyn thing with my parents. When my sister came along, my parents were then, okay, it's the second kid, you know. So she was a little princess. She was treated as a little princess. And when my brother came along, my father and, and parent, mother were so tired, they said, okay, he's a third kid. You know, we'll just do what we can and, you know, let him muddle through on his own. And he did. So as a result, my sister and brother both have higher degrees of education. Uh, I got sick as a child. You so, did? Yeah, I had a disease called encephalitis, which is brain fever. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, it affected some of my mentation. Although people have always called me crazy. So. Yeah, encephalitis that's, that's is of, no joke. Yeah. Anyway, it was at the age of nine that I got it. And ever since then, I had allergies and, <clears throat> and a whole plethora of things that happened. And what? I had a whole bunch of things that happened with the encephalitis. After the encephalitis, I, there were a lot of limitations that I had. Got it. Sleeping sickness, uh, waking, falling asleep, not being able to... Uh, concentrate you know so after about eight months or so i was diagnosed with this by what they call a glandular specialist now they call them endocrinologists and my mother said well i understand you're one of the good glandular people in the united states and he said no my dear the world wow 
at that point, there weren't any endocrinologists. There were glandulars there. So he had diagnosed and there was no medication for it. That's it. Hospitalized a couple of times, spinal taps. The best incident, though, that I could tell you about is when I was seven years old, a little girl, a friend of mine, was running out in the middle of the street. And I saw a car coming and I pushed her out of the way of the car. And I got hit. Back then, they didn't use anesthesia to set your leg. So they brought me to the doctor's office and crunch. <laughs> I walked around with a cat, uh, you know, limped around with a cast for about four months. And, you know, it was fun. Did she ever thank you or come back in your oh, life? Oh, no, 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 no. Quite the contrary. Her mother came upstairs my parents' house and said, you ripped my daughter's coat. No, I really never realized how many curse words I really knew at the age of seven. <laughs> but I used all of them. <laughs> Good for all you. Them, every single one. <laughs> uh, you know, it's been an interesting, it was an interesting childhood. What can I tell you? What kind of work did you do? You said that uh, you were born and you worked. Uh, and you, you got wanted married. Three, say, you wanted a three sentence. You, you wanted said, a three oh, sentence. Your no, dad was an accountant. What were you? I know. I didn't uh, read the whole the whole long thing. I glanced yeah. at it, but I didn't have the okay. focus to read it. Right. Uh, I got. I went to college. Even. My mother was afraid of my actually being drafted during the Vietnam War. But I never would have been drafted because I had so many illnesses, including yeah. asthma, wow. obesity, the whole bit, that they never would have. So she shipped me off to Israel, of all the places, and I was there for 10 months. I was doing poorly in school anyhow. I was poorly. Uh, I, I was very helpful to get uh, respectable D's in high school. To get that what? D like David's. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, you know, if that I would get an occasional A in music, D in history, D's in English, D's and F's in math. Anyhow, <clears throat> pardon me. I was a terrible student, so I understand, and I don't judge you. <laughs> so how long, you were in Israel for 10 months. How did you like Israel? I enjoyed the World War II survivors. I did not like people my own age. The men hated me, actually, because the men, Israeli men would hate me. They would glare at me because they figured that I would marry an American girl and deprive them of a chance to get out of Israel. Whoa. Because you must serve in the army if you're in Israel. Two years for your first service and then you have to do a tour every year. There, At least when I was um, after about I enjoyed the people, I enjoyed the country. They made me work. I lost a hell of a lot of weight. I went there at like 200 pounds and I came back at 165. And I had done all sorts of I lived on the kibbutz. No way. What was that like? Well, it's a business like any other business. Uh, they offered me the chance to go to college there. The way that it works is that for every year of schooling that they send you to, you would have to give two years back of service to the books. Granted, you would not have to pay any tuition back. You would have to give service of your life. Uh, I had left. I was a high school dropout, remember, because I was getting where I was. 
And when I graduated, uh, when I got back, you know, when I, I decided after 10 months, it was enough. I had learned everything I was going to learn in Israel. I met beautiful people. I had my first lover there, my first experience, as it were. But the wow. lady wanted to get married, and I wasn't in a marrying mood. <laughs> I was 18. I just turned 18. And she was in her mid-20s, possibly 30. Oh. And uh, all, of my, all of your young viewers out there, they, older women, they can teach you a hell. You know, you know, they 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 are better with me. <laughs> the and look ladies, on your face when you said that was yeah, priceless. It's true. It's true. <laughs> it is true. I just saw your whole life flash before my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the lady was quite persistent. She actually came to the United States to try to convince me to uh, marry her. And I had actually told her, don't come because I'm not getting married. I was starting college at that point. I wasn't going to leave. Uh, I'd actually gone to night school. And as a portent of things to come, when I was getting my high school diploma in mm -hmm. evening school, mm -hmm. the principal said, oh, you don't want an academic diploma. You have enough of credits for a general diploma. And I said, okay, at which point he took out his bottle of India ink and he was signing the diplomas in India ink. And he blotted mine, he put a pink blot on mine. So that tells you exactly how my college career went to go. <laughs> it worked its way through. I went, to, I went to East University and then I went to, I was asked, and seeing as how my attitude is, you can tell, is a little bit of a scamp. I was formally asked or informally asked to leave Pace University. You were asked to leave what? I was asked to leave the Pace University. They told me to leave. And he wanted I said, you to pick up the Pace and... No, no, no. They just said I was on the wrong side of a tenure debate. Oh. The teacher and the school. And uh, the dean looked at me and said, Mr. Glad, you know why we let students like you in? And I said, because you don't have to let us out. And he said, he then gave me a crocodile smile. <laughs> And I realized that my bridges had been burned and I had to leave. <laughs> and then I went to Fordham University. And luckily enough, uh, my mother had applied for and gotten vocational rehabilitation service for me. So the state of New York paid for my education. Wonderful. And then after that, I got a degree in psychology and history. And, and what you, know, you do with that? It's called being unemployed. <laughs> because you can't do anything with a bachelor's in anything, even back then. So what I did after that was I had uh, taken a job. I had looked <clears> for <throat> jobs. And I had gotten a part-time job working as a mental hygiene assistant therapy aide. In short, a man with a butterfly net. <laughs> as there you you referred to. And I worked with a learning able populate, which that is very, is... very difficult because they are not pleasant to look at. Because what? They are not pleasant to look at. The uh, developmentally disabled, the learning disabled since they don't have a lot of social mores that we're used to, are not able to communicate or act in the manner that we're all used to. And because of that, they're not privy to look. 
Some of them can be very sweet. Some of them can be fairly intelligent. Some of them are extremely violent. And I worked with them for almost two years. And I saw an opportunity to get a different job. And I took that opportunity in a completely different field. So essentially, after graduating college, I did work in my field of psychology, but it was not what I wanted to do because I could not do anything without a PhD in it unless I wanted to be servant of working with the population that would be learning disabled all the time. Mm -hmm. So then I took a state job and I got a job as a tax collector. I should make note that part of the learning disabled job to get a permanent job, I had to take a job at the building formerly known as Willowbrook the complex known as Willowbrook, which did make the papers in the 70s because Geraldo Rivera did an expose on how the clients were treated, which was they were treated like animals at Willowbrook. Willowbrook, by the way, no longer exists. Uh, and their conditions were pretty bad. Uh, the clients were given nothing to do. They had no games. They had, they had no televisions. They had, uh, <clears throat> they had no televisions. They had no entertainment. There was nothing for them to do. They were bored out of their minds. Okay. So luckily enough, I had brought some games in with me that they were able to play and work. Mm -hmm. But they had a very, very mixed population. They would have higher intelligent individuals and with lower intelligence. And that population cannot get along because some of the lower intelligent populations have very bizarre behaviors. Mm -hmm. After that, I took make another exam and I became a tax agent. Then I became a supervisor, which is very unusual because my father was an accountant. Yeah, so I was gonna say that. Of the, uh, so he said, how could you possibly be a tax collector? You know, you're going <laughs> the whole, it's contrary, you know, it's contraindicated that. So I became a tax agent. And along the way, I learned, I met a magician who taught me how to do balloon animals. And I started twisting balloon animals. That was interesting. I didn't use it, uh, you know, entertaining myself, or entertaining some people occasionally. How many years did you do that? You didn't work in a profession. I did that as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And I still occasionally do it. But now my hands are not working properly. So I cannot, I don't have fine uh, manipulation that you need yeah. to do with that, especially yeah. with small balloons. And um, then after that, you started, you were acting and singing. Let's hear about your acting and singing. Uh, after I retired, because I had a couple of jobs in between that, social service, all the money that I ever collected in the tax department, I gave away when I worked at social services. After that, I worked for HR Block for a while. Then I said, well, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't have to work. I don't need to work. What else can I do? And I read an article by someone. He said, oh, I have two lamps that I want, you know, want to give to somebody. And I visited this person out on the island. I repaired the lamps for him. And he said, no, I don't want that one back, but I want this one back because I used it in the school. And he said, why don't you join an acting group? And I said, I don't know of it. And he actually sent me uh, <clears throat> a Newsday copy that showed the Senior Theater Acting Repertory Group, star, And I went down and I auditioned. I was told, no, 
you're not an actor. We don't want you. You're not memorizing lines. You're doing it the way we want. You're doing it the way you want, which is not what they do. They have to listen to what the director says. On the other hand, the music director, she said, wait a minute. How about you sing for us? I was not prepared. I didn't have anything. But I sang. I started off by singing more. <clears throat> the theme from Mondo Kani. And she said, guess what? You're our baritone. So I worked with them for about three years. And we did shows for senior centers. Wow. And uh, nursing homes. And then COVID hit. And that brings us up to where we're at now. Basically, yes. And with COVID, uh, my adopted sister, Helen, Helen Yaloff, said, oh, well, there's this comedy group that I'm a member of. Why don't you join? Did you so, say she's your sister? My adopted sister. I love Helen. I interviewed her. She is so special. Yeah, well, some people might think she's actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, some people might think what? She's precious. Yes. Yeah, Helen has a way about her. She's been on stage all of her life. This was her life. Uh, she's been teacher, educator, actress, drama person, you know, led she's, her own theater. No Ooh. matter what she does, she's a scene <laughs> stealer. Yes, she is. She does do that. She tries her best. Uh, she and I she wrote a play. I acted in the play. I played the part of William Shatner. How'd that go? Ah, I flubbed my lines again. <laughs> yeah. And she was in my acting, my, uh, acting play, which was uh, Lana Lang marrying Super, uh, Mary Lex Luthor, which I wrote for a different comedian. And we froze. <laughs> You froze. Well, talk to end. me. Talk to me and the people that are going to watch this later on. Talk to us about you doing comedy. Well, remember, I had very little experience doing comedy aside from listening to my mother tell dirty jokes as we all did when we grew up. But my comedy started with Joe, and she said, "Write a skit." And Joe Firestone in our Joe class. Joe Firestone in our, of our class. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a skit. And she said, okay, guess what? You're going to perform at Little Fields. And this is your topic. It's going to be on body parts. So I sent you two links for that. I sent you the body part link, which everybody part it in and then surprise surprise we got actually got paid it was surprising paid money and i didn't want money i figured that you know she was training us so you know let her keep the money but she said yeah. no you're gonna get paid then she said oh there's someone else a video guy by the name of vincent moraz he is of course somebody as well little did we know he was doing a monetized thing for himself uh, using Council of the Art money and New York State money. And he got a big chunk of that for himself. But we drafted separate plays for that, which he put on. And I sent you the link for that as well. So you have two links to two different shows. The third show, which was done by Peacock, uh, good timing. Unfortunately, that involved three days of taping, and I could not do three days going into the city, not knowing what my physicalities were, because whenever I walk a great distance, I fall. And falling is not good at my age at this point. And then I found out just recently that this was due to 
my cervical spine injury that I will fall and I have a lot of other things going on. If you fall a lot, you really can't exercise as much as you should. This COVID has put on. Oh, the only thing I want to do is eat. And the last thing I need to do is eat. So that's what COVID has done with me. I fall a lot. I fall a lot too. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry you fall. Yeah, yeah. But I wasn't as brave as you. I didn't learn how to eat dirt. You didn't <laughs> learn how to eat dirt. One of the, <laughs> yeah. one of the, uh, one, of the uh, one of the, one of the people that I work with for the state of New York was a nurse, and she was an army nurse, and she said made no bones about it. She said, "Oh, they're in the army. They had they had to learn how to eat dirt. That was part <laughs> of the army routine." Uh, well, what about the Navy? Well, they have to learn how to like water. You know? <laughs> oh, you know. He said, we don't talk about the Air Force. Yeah. <laughs> they need to like air. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody likes air. It's good to breathe would, once in a while. You would you know? think. Yeah. So because. you're not in the show, Good Timing. No, I could not make You're that. part of the class. And right. good timing has hit the airwaves and it's getting rave reviews and you're still a part of the weekly class. So right. speak to me and people that will watch this about the benefit of being in a, a comedy training class, no matter what age you are. Well, it's important to be in any class as much as involved with one, whether it be learning how to twist balloons or speaking publicly or learning comedy because comedy is a trade just like anything else. Everything has to be learned. I had a great experience dealing with the public, speaking public. I'm not afraid of dealing with an audience. It's always that first couple of seconds where you have a pause before you're dealing with an audience and know how to speak with them or deal with them. So I'm not afraid of doing that. But this is also a learned aspect. Yes. How it's do you feel? How, how do you feel about having been in the class and your future in the comedy world? Well, I was thinking of going to an open mic night and getting my feet wet doing that. The problem is, again, you have to climb up on stage and you have to use steps and walk. And this gets to be a problem. Uh, I know that the insurance on these clubs is not that great, if I recall. Uh, especially since if anybody watches Peacock, they can see one of our class members actually falling on the TV show. That was BB. She fell. She actually fell. She rolled backwards. And I keep, you know, every time I send her a text, I say, oh, well, you're the acrobat of the class. <laughs> you know, but she actually physically fell, approached the microphone, and then rolled backwards. Uh, luckily enough, she uh, didn't hurt herself, but I mean, she's really weird. So you have to be careful, and I have to be careful of what I do. And I'm intending on continuing the class. Uh, I may take some paid courses, and they offer quite a bit of them. And the what about Zoom comedy mics and Zoom comedy shows for you and showcases? Well, there are, there are actually many Zoom classes that take place from bars all around the world mm -hmm. that one of our members participates in. Mm -hmm. Helene Witt mm -hmm. uh, Helene, joined yes. a lot of these. And I had actually participated in one that she said link to that took place very old England and it was like two o'clock in the morning there and they had open mic and you know uh, people were as it, the <clears throat> comedians were challenging questions in the audience so I answered one back and he and I had interplay with each other yes I had my experience with broadcast that way now I'm having another experience with broadcast this way Yes. Because I have never done a podcast with anybody before. 
Got no. it. So how, in terms of your own comedy writing, how much comedy material have you written that you could do in one sitting? Well, in one sitting, I think I could do, I did eight minutes for Little Fields. Wow. And that was basically uh, talking about my favorite body part. That was hilarious. Yeah. I don't know if you saw it. Yes, uh, I heard it. it. Yeah, yeah. It is, a, it is a bit on the dirty side for them. Sure. Yeah. But uh, I don't want to offend your audience. So we won't go into that one now. Uh, the other one, uh, Lex Luthor marrying Lana Lang. People in a, in a little bit of a tizzy. Because it starts off with uh, Green Lantern and Superman flying up and uh, talking to each other. And Green Lantern saying, so did you get your invite to the wedding? And Superman saying, yeah, I got my invite, but I don't know if I'll go. And yeah, and Green Lantern saying to Superman, but you know, isn't it weird how Lana Lang's gonna marry your arch enemy Lex Luthor? And Superman says, yeah, I really don't know what's wrong with that woman. After all, you know, uh, she was my first, so, you know, how she can go out and turn tail like that is something else. And, you know, I don't know if I'll go or not. And if I do go, you know, you know, when I get, it was, I was given the invitation by Lex Luthor mm -hmm. and I nearly gave myself away because he saw that when he told me that he was going to marry Lana, I accidentally melted my glasses when I was Clark Kent. <laughs> so, you know, you know, so it, it's just doing interplays like that. And then it goes on with Lana being uh, bride shy. You know, you know, like, oh, this is a mistake. My mother told me not to marry you because, you know, of all your enemies. And, you know, everybody's going to come after you. And, you know, all of Superman's friends are going to come after us. And they're going to treat us like crap. And, <clears throat> and it goes on a little bit more, you know, with, well, what did you do about this? That is challenging. Saying hysterical bride. You know, well, what did you do about all your enemies and all the governments that you've pissed off and all the people that you've defended? You know, well, I paid off all the governments. And I've given everybody a lot of money. And I you know, cured cancer, and I've cured all these diseases, I've made everybody well, you know, the whole world is perfect. Well, what about all the assassins that want to kill you? They're going to kind of want to kill me too. No, it's all taken care of. Don't worry about it. She's playing historical yeah. bride all the way through, you know, at the end of it is, uh, this is where Helen had a problem. She said, well, wait a minute, you're you're playing Lana Lang as if she's never had sex before. Didn't didn't Luther sample the goods? And I said, no, he didn't. And you know, it ends with <clears throat> just saying, Well, now I get to see my present unwrapped. <laughs> and, and you know, and Lana says, says to him, Well, did you bring your little blue pill with you? <laughs> so and out after well now that we're getting near the end of our time and i thank you again for coming on i have one parting question it's philosophical and i want it you can talk short or long however you want to answer it i want to know what advice do you have for people to be better human beings now that we've gone through this pandemic? Really, we have not finished going through the pandemic because <laughs> a quarter of the population of the United States refused to not. Right. Out of ignorance or stupidity. Uh, I'm not going to mention political candidates or and we get into a situation of a lot of people become argumentative about that. All I can say is that 
if you want to have a better place, you have to be of a better mind. You can't be the aggressor all the time in everything you do. Uh, my philosophy has always been live and let live, unless you're really stupid in which case I'll tell you. <laughs> and if you can take it, great. And if you can't take it, there's a limit to what I can tolerate. I have friends who are uh, very dedicated to being anti-vaxxers. They're what? They're very dedicated to being anti-vaxxers. Oh. And I can't help them with that. No. There are people who, you know, are in favor of one political candidate versus another. And I say, well, what did one do for another or not? And then you get into more arguments. Right. You cannot argue with people. That's a, you know, so what do I see coming better? I see the world going on as it is. I don't see anybody really stupid blowing us all up. What? I don't see anyone being so stupid as to blow us all up. Yeah. That. Oh, I think the world is going to muddle on fine. You know, unfortunately, it was our parents and their parents that screwed up the earth. And I don't know if our kids or we or our kids are any better. You know, the world stays around a little bit longer so that, you know, everybody can have a chance to play it. Yes. And I do and hope everybody has a nice life. You know, take care of each other and take care of our planet. Exactly. So it's been very pleasant and I appreciate the opportunity, Linda. I thank you very, very much. Is there anything in closing that you, Alex Glad, actor, comedian, balloon, not carver, balloon artist, how'd I do? Yeah, balloon sculptor. Yeah. Sculptor. Balloon sculptor. sculptor. Ex accountant from Brooklyn. Not accountant. Uh, tax. Collector. Collector, which, right. which we tax all agency. love, a tax collector. They're, oh, yeah. You got to have yeah. one at every party. Yeah. Oh, sure. It's like yeah. inviting the police. I mean, it's, you know. Well, you know, no, even police hate us. Because I have a police officer who called me up and said he was unemployed, didn't work. And then my boss said, send out an inquiry, see if he's working. And I called him up and I said, guess what? You no longer have a bank account. Wow. You no longer have a car. Cool. And we're sending an information to your boss that you avoided paying your taxes. So you have a nice life. I fall back and we're crying. On the other hand, I've been on the other side of a police car too, where I've been crying. Yes. So turnabout is fair play. Yeah. It, it is what it is. Yep. So I'll see you when, whenever I can start feeling better and make it to the 7 a.m. Pacific time class of Joe Firestones at the Greenwich House. And I wish you all the best with your upcoming neck surgery. And one last little question. It's personal. You don't have to answer it. Honestly. I was going to tell a joke, actually, but go ahead. Okay, I want you to do that as soon as I get my answer. On a scale of one to ten, you and your son, how the how um, healed are you from COVID? Or are you having lingering? You're having lingering breathing issues, right? Yes, my what voice has actually changed. My voice has changed. My singing voice. So I cannot participate in my singing at this time. And I don't know if that's due to the cervical spine or to the COVID. I suspect it's more the COVID. Yeah. And then your son, how is he faring from COVID? He seems to be doing better. He seems to be doing fine. He's much younger than I am. Right. We had him much later. So. Okay. 
and your wife right. escaped it all because she's immune. That's so you're so blessed for that. Wow. Yep. Yep. And now for uh, now for a joke, if you'd like for your yes. audience. Of course, I'd like a joke. You want to throw a free joke at me? Do it. Sure, sure. A 95-year-old gentleman decides that he's going to buy himself a Corvette, a speed, speedy race, race car. He goes out, he buys this lovely speedy car, and he drives. And he's going 95 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, 120 miles an hour. And then re, 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 the police come up after him. Policeman gets out. He rolls at the guy. Uh, Archer rolls down the window, and the officer says, "Okay, what was it? A wake or a wedding?" And the officer looks at his watch and says, "You know, considering everything else, it's near the end of my shift. If you give me one good reason why I should let you off the hook, I'll let you go." And Codger thinks for a second and says very benignly, officer, 30, 35 years ago, a police officer ran off with my wife. I thought you were bringing her back. I love that joke. I yeah, love you that joke. A thousand times. Yeah. Oh, but I love the way you said it. Yeah. You did a great job. All right. Took well, it, you resurrected a very old joke and you made it you made it your own. I mean, if I was Simon Cowell, I would have everybody stand up and give you all what do they give them? Tens? I don't know. You know X's. Well, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. That was really a good you delivered the joke very well. I didn't even know it was the same joke. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex Glad. I'm Have a nice you, See you Take in care. the class. Will you be there this coming Monday? Yes, I will. Yes, I will, Ms. Marcus. Yes, I will be there. <laughs> I'll try to make it. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.